Is your caravan overloaded? Are you sitting there perhaps saying, ah, she'll be right, in the great Aussie Bogan tradition? Well, today, if that's you, I want to talk to you about the dude who is sitting behind bars, sentenced to six and a half years in the slammer because he went, ah, she'll be right. And then the day just went horribly wrong. I'm John Kenogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Even vehicles to tow caravans, perversely enough. Australia only though. Website. Card. Now, I do hate caravans and I appreciate that you've clicked on this fine video because you don't. I just don't understand them. The attraction of the acoustically transparent aluminium chitois, the porter hovel, which allows you to take your effluent endlessly on tour, despite the fact that we have resorts now. You can fly there, and there are hotties in bikinis sipping mojitos. Each to their own, I suppose. Caravans to me are an IQ test, and if you own one, let's not be sitting by the phone expecting that call from Mensa anytime soon. The only thing I hate more than a frickin' caravan is a grossly overloaded caravan. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. I'm no IT expert, but I've seen enough, especially lately, about data breaches, scams and hacks to know that being online is inherently risky and potentially very costly. You don't have to be tech savvy to use NordVPN. It's a simple one-stop cyber security solution. One click and you are protected from hackers, malware and pop-ups across as many as six devices. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now and you'll get three to 12 months extra time on any two year subscription as part of Nord's 11th birthday celebration plus one more bonus month just for using the nordvpn.com slash AEJC link in the description. NordVPN is the world's fastest VPN and it only costs about as much as a cup of coffee every month to keep your data, your identity and your devices secure. NordVPN can also save you money because you can assign your virtual location to another country where, for example, flights and accommodation might be cheaper than they are back home. Same goes for streaming services. You can also access live sporting events and other content that may not be available where you actually live. That's a pretty small price to pay for cyber security, not to mention the potential savings also on the table. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now to get a huge discount off your plan plus a free 11th birthday gift and all that additional free subscription time. Totally risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. And thanks to Nord for sponsoring this episode. On the 3rd of January 2019, a dude you've probably never heard of named Stephen George Russell was driving his Prado and towing his Chitois from Tamworth and heading for Warhope, which is near Port Macquarie on the coast in New South Wales. And this is not an uncommon sight in that neck of the woods or at that time of the year. And if you don't mind, I'm going to refer more than usual to my notes because this report does concern a pretty compelling tragedy and it's important to get the facts right. I'm relying on information from official court documentation and the purpose of this report, I must stress, is not to shock you, it's not to worry you, it's to stop you making this mistake, okay? Because the biggest tragedy of all would be that despite the fact that this has happened, it happens again and I really don't want to see you in Mr Russell's position. So what was uncommon about Mr. Russell's conduct in that time and place was the degree of overloading of the van, which frankly to me is staggering, staggering. He was using the van as a removalist truck, essentially. That's according to court documentation. The aggregate trailer mass of his van, which was a fine, beautiful Jayco Heritage Chitois, 2,387 kilos. 
That's the maximum permitted all up weight of that van. The actual weight of the loaded van, 3,200. So 2387 versus 3200. How overloaded was it, dude? Write it down. What is it? Take away the number you first thought of. It's 813 kilos over, which is, that's beyond the pale, right? The Prado was also heavily loaded. It had four people on board. There was a boat on the roof. In my estimation, this is the full Jed Clampett and family Beverly Hills moving odyssey only to Rooty Hill by the coast and missing only Granny in a wooden rocking chair, perhaps on the roof of the van. You're just not allowed to drive vehicles like that on a public road. It offends me that people do. Sorry for being so serious about it. Mr Russell, he's an experienced truck driver, according to the court, right? He's in his late 50s at the time of this incident. And I don't see how he could conceivably not have known that the combination was grossly overloaded, right? Like, the vehicle is down to first gear to get up the hills. Does that not tell you something about the load that is imposed upon the powertrain? Like, Jesus. And in addition to the gross overloading, according to the court documents, the tow ball download limit was blown, the axles were overloaded, and the tyres were overloaded. So this is like, let's just tick every ding box and invite the Grim Reaper in for a quick two for one after a cup of tea. Roughly halfway to paradise, okay? So they, they've covered roughly 130 k's. It's roughly 250 for the whole trip. So they're at about 130. And they're descending into this place that most of us have never heard of called Yarrowitch, which is probably home to the National Banjo Museum, right? They're descending into the Yarrowitch Valley. And the convoy from hell finally picks up a bit of speed. Mr. Ver Mr. Russell's van gets the death wobbles, right? And I've got to go through this demo. I always do this. Let's just suggest that this is a caravan. And caravans are pig trailers. Pig trailers are characterised by having the axles in the centre. Unlike a dog trailer, which has the axles out here on the corners, right? A caravan, a boat, a camper trailer, a box trailer, they have... Axles in the middle. It makes them pig trailers, okay? And the single overarching thing about pig trailers is that they are unstable in pitch and they are unstable in yaw. So towing this way, let's say towing downhill this way, unstable like that, unstable like that. Very susceptible to being upset by bumps and other defects in the road. And the only thing stopping them going completely out of control in your and pitch is the vehicle doing the towing. Because the vehicle doing the towing has its wheels at the corners. It's comparatively heavy as well. It has inertia. It has inertia in all rotational sensors as well as in linear sensors, okay? At the risk of being an ambient physics nut. However, the more massive you make the van, the less restraint proportionally can be provided by the vehicle. So the, the van can go out of control and take the vehicle with it if it is sufficiently heavy. You're never going to get a 6x4 box trailer with a little bit of firewood on board do that, or taking a load to the tip or something, unless you fill it full of plutonium. But a big van has the capacity to push the towing vehicle and itself off the road comparatively easily because of its comparative massiveness relative to the tow vehicle. And this is exactly what's happening here. These horrible feedback effects, and people call it sway or the death wobbles, whatever, you know, they start to happen and they can go out of control very quickly when the van becomes something of a pendulum doing this backwards and forwards. And sometimes the driver even contributes to this kind of loss of control by counter steering and effectively feeding back into the motion and unwittingly amplifying it. And I'm not sure what happened here. The whole thing probably just went out of control and there's nothing Mr. Russell could have done about it when that happened. Certainly there's hard to foresee 
any sort of scenario in which some superhuman driving countermeasure would have overcome the problem once it had manifested itself on the road. The van gets the death wobbles and then the Grim Reaper just steps through the window that you've just opened and here's what happened. Mr. Russell loses control of the combination. This is all according to court documentation, right? The van rolls and it breaks the tow bar. It separates from the vehicle, breaks the safety chains and it slams into a guardrail. This is the caravan, okay? The chassis and the contents, it's like all of our worldly possessions plus the chassis just get shotgunned all over the road. This is a lot of kinetic mayhem, all right? The vehicle also leaves the road and it collides with one of those wire rope arresting kind of barriers and it rolls. The boat and the roof on the passenger side of the Prado, they slam into a tree on the passenger side. The boat comes loose and the roof fails catastrophically, like it's a complete catastrophic structural failure of the roof. The vehicle rebounds off the tree because of elastic strain energy and it bounces upright and it comes to rest on an embankment below the tree. It must be very difficult, not to mention confronting for all of the emergency services people, but technically difficult to decompile all of these events forensically, you know. But when someone dies, this is what happens. Someone has to do this grisly work. And then these facts appear in court documentation and hopefully we can prevent it from happening again, okay? When the paramedics and the emergency registrars talk about high mechanism crashes or high mechanism injuries. This is the kind of thing they're on about, you know. It's almost the difference between being shot by a handgun and shot by a rifle because the, the nature of the injuries is so much more severe because of the velocity of the projectile out of a rifle. This is that, only with impacts with cars. The version of events that I've just told you comes straight from court documentation. I'm not making it up. It's not eyewitness testimony. There were no eyewitnesses who weren't in the vehicle. To my knowledge, they're certainly not referenced in the court rulings that I've seen. Okay, It comes from the New South Wales Court of Criminal Appeals. Tragically, as a result of this crash, and I'm not trying to confront you or make you feel bad on an otherwise perfectly serviceable day, but Mr Russell's wife of over 30 years, Lynette, she dies from her injuries as a result of this loss of control and crash. And so does her son, whose name is Stephen. He was Mr. Russell's stepson. Okay? Stephen Russell's partner, who, a woman named Lisa Willis, is also grievously injured in the crash. She suffers a fractured skull and a broken pelvis and sundry other injuries which constitute, in totality, a pretty serious orthopaedic surgery challenge. It's impossible to see the lighter side of anything like this. I can usually make most things funny. This is not one of those things, okay? The vehicle gets forensically examined, obviously, and it's found not to be defective, and the caravan is also investigated and its brakes were working. And I'd suggest that if you think about being in that position, you know, there's, there's no moral arc when it comes to road trauma. There's, there's no morality, right? Like, how many times have you heard a story where the drunk driver survives, but mum and dad, they die in the car that he hits, and the two little kids in the back, they're orphans, right? That shit happens all the time with road trauma. It is completely and utterly morally unjust, and that's why it's really best avoided, right? So let's... um. Think about that for a moment. This is not bad luck. Like a lot of people say, oh, that's terrible, mate. You know, that's terrible. But it's not, it is terrible, but it's not bad luck. This is a set of circumstances that flow from an indefensible choice. People make choices all the time. You choose to smoke or not. You choose to text when you're walking across a busy road, you know. There are consequences, and this is a consequence of making an indefensible decision, in my estimation, which I freaking urge you not to make. Like, that's kind of why I'm making this video. So let us leave the tragedy behind somewhat and then just fast forward three and a half years, okay? Mr. Russell gets convicted of two counts of dangerous driving occasioning death of his wife and his stepson. 
and one count of dangerous driving occasioning grievous bodily harm of his stepson's partner, Lisa Willis. Okay. Now, these offences, you're probably familiar with traffic offences like speeding and uh, drink driving and things of that nature, you know, red light offences, whatever. It is possible to commit crimes behind a car, uh, behind the wheel of a car, and both of those offences are offences under the Crimes Act. And it's really important to realise that there's a big distinction between the seriousness of offences under the Crimes Act and traffic offences. Not that traffic offences aren't serious, but they're on a different spectrum, okay? Crimes Act type offences are pretty serious, and this is reflected in things like the New South Wales and every other uh, state's police pursuit policy. They have a safe driving policy, right? And police are allowed to break traffic rules when they drive a car. They're allowed to speed, they're allowed to go through red lights, they're allowed to do all kinds of things that we're not allowed to do in some circumstances. But they're not allowed to commit crimes. So the purpose of having something like a safe driving policy for the police is so that they can't commit dangerous driving occasioning death because they're not allowed to do that. That's a crime, right? And what it means is that when you see in a news report they've pursued somebody and the somebody that they're pursuing has crashed and died or been grievously injured, you'll always see a section of that report where it says the police discontinued their pursuit shortly before the crash because that's in compliance with their safe driving policy and it insulates them from being convicted of committing dangerous driving occasioning death okay that whether or not they did in fact discontinue the pursuit just seconds before the crash because of their strange mental powers allowing them to foresee the future that's debatable but that's why they always claim to do that in case you were interested in decompiling that aspect of grisly news reports. Right. So he's convicted of these three crimes offence counts. Two offences, three counts. The District Court of New South Wales, uh, this was a judge and jury trial, so a jury found him guilty and a judge sentenced him. They sentenced Mr Russell to four years in custody with a two-year non-parole period. And he's been inside before. He's known to the court. He's committed other offences. He's not a person that a court would hear a claim of. He's of good character, OK? That's, uh, that's pretty defensible to say that, I think. And as a consequence of this sentence, and I can understand this and I share their view, the Department of Public Prosecutions just goes off its tits and appeals because in their estimation, the sentence is manifestly inadequate. And you've got to appreciate that crimes-type offences, there's a victim, but the crime itself is committed against the state. Okay, So if someone murders someone else, the victim is the person who's killed, obviously, but the state feels as if the offence was committed against it and it prosecutes the offence, the offender, the alleged offence, offender. That's why it's always State versus Smith or whatever, you know. So the Department of Public Prosecutions goes, that's manifestly inadequate for the life of two people and the grievous injury of a third person. And uh, then on the 22nd of December last year, so Merry Christmas that. The Court of Criminal Appeal in New South Wales, which I think is part of the Supreme Court, anyway, it sided with the DPP and it upped Mr Russell's sentence to six and a half years and it doubled his non-parole period to four years behind bars before he's eligible for parole. So he's eligible to be back driving among us potentially, I suppose, perhaps in May of 2026. The Appeals Court also made one other super important determination which is highly relevant to you if you don't know if your van is overloaded or if you do know and you're saying, ah, she'd be right, done it before, okay? At the original trial, okay, the district court accepted the defence's proposition that the dangerous driving aspect of Mr Russell's conduct began only when the trailer, the van, started to sway. Okay, That's, that is, like it just got on the path to crashing and all of the tragedy. So the dangerous driving in the initial judgment was just brief. It was just from the sway to the crash, which must have been only a matter of seconds. 
But the three judges who heard the appeal six months later, okay, they found that, quote, the dangerousness arose from the respondent's deliberate decision to set off on a journey towing a grossly overloaded caravan. So that's a legal precedent right now. And that means that he was driving dangerously for about 130 kilometres, not for a few seconds. And it's a consequence of the deliberate decision to set off on a journey towing a grossly overloaded caravan. There's no wording in that sentence that suggests to me that you have to know that it's grossly overloaded, right? It's just the decision to do that act. The gross overloading exists independent of your knowledge of it, at least according to my reading of that determination. And we could argue the semantics all day long, I suppose. But this is a worst-case scenario. If you make a deliberate decision to drive a vehicle that is grossly overloaded and then you have a day like Mr Russell had, then you are looking down the barrel of this. So it's not only dangerous if something goes wrong. It's dangerous at the point at which you load the chambers and start playing Russian roulette, okay? In other words, you're going to be morally culpable for the decisions you make. And I guess this is not unlike other aspects of life where you might enter into a dispute face-to-face -face with someone at a, po at a pub after, you know, 27 beers or something. That often ends badly as well. The reason I bring this to your attention, in addition to my abject hatred of quarter slums, and as your prime minister, which I hope to be in 2025, for the 2025 election, my first act in Parliament after my inauguration is going to be to gazette the National Effluent Carriage Wheel Clamping Perpetuity Bill, right? Just to make the roads better. And it's my small part of making Australia just a little less shit. I do fucking hate caravans. I mean that quite sincerely. But they are part of the road landscape. And if you own one, you would not want to be Mr. Russell anytime soon. You would not want to be Russell 2.0, I'd suggest. The real reason I'm bringing this up is that overloading is such a fucking epidemic on Australian roads. It really is. The Queensland Police, right, they did a bit of public education on this. They did a purge that did not involve handing out any infringements, but they did pull vehicles towing vans over on the Landsborough Highway, which is about 1,050 kilometres long and goes deep into the outback sort of thing, and they found that 9 out of 10 of the vehicles they tested were overweight. And being overweight is obviously a continuum, right? There's being overweight by one kilo and being overweight in the manner of Mr Russell's van over here. And some of those vehicles that they pulled over may have been so dangerously overloaded up this end of the spectrum that urgent intervention was warranted. You know, you should just not drive something if it's overloaded. Similar exercise in New South Wales recently found that 75% of vehicles that were weighed were overweight, okay? So it's not as if this is a hen's tooth rarity kind of uh, concept at all. What I'm saying is don't hope for the best with this stuff. And I'm pretty sure, oh, I had no idea... I've done it before, it was all good, your worship. I don't think that's going to help if you're in that situation. Pretty sure it's not. So do not say, ah, she be right, mate, done it before. Get expert help and don't send me an email because I'm not interested in helping you for free. Pay somebody to help you set up your combination legally. And don't just go, oh, yeah, it looks okay. Run your combination over a waybridge and get a ticket with measurements on it that tells you that you freaking well comply. This is not going to insulate you from tragedy but it's going to insulate you to some degree, I would have thought, from committing an act of dangerous driving occasioning death and going inside for the next four to six and a half years. And I'm pretty sure we all want that, especially you.